Layer 1 Murfreesboro Mud Monster This cryptid was first seen at midnight in 1973 when a couple was parked by a riverside when they came face to face with a huge, hairy, mud slathered beast. During the summer of 1973, for about two weeks, in the town of Murfreesboro, Illinois. The cryptid is also known as the Big Muddy Monster. According to Cryptid Wiki, this is one of the most frightening cases in the history of Bigfoot sightings slash encounters. Apart from the 1973 flap of this cryptid, there were some isolated events, like on July 7th, 1975, two men from Murfreesboro reported sighting a creature that they believed was the Murfreesboro Mud Monster. They saw it near a pond in the Harrison community in North Murfreesboro. It has become part of local folklore since then. Also apparently, also apparently, it is the most famous family member uh, of an overarching group of creatures called abominable swamp slobs. So I guess like a subsect of Bigfoot. Uh, I don't know. I should probably look into that though. <laughs> Coal Hollow Road Monster. This cryptid is around eight to nine feet tall and it is apparently covered in whitish gray hair. It resembles a cross between an ape and a caveman. It has red lips, long round ears, and human-like hands. Also when it leaves tracks, uh, snow for example, it shows that it has three toes and it also left behind a nasty smell that was described as that of a wet dog mixed with rotten eggs. In May of 1972, a man named Randall Emmert and his friends reported seeing a large white-haired creature in the woods near Coal Hollow Road in Pekin, Illinois. They called a local radio station to describe what they saw. After the radio station call on May 25th, the East Peoria Police Station received more than 200 calls from people who claimed to see a creature. It was walking through the woods by riverbanks, yards, and even destroyed fences. There was a search effort on July of the same year, 1972, but it was called off when one of the 100 volunteers shot himself in the foot. What the fuck? Fucking moron. Uh, <laughs> years later, Randall Emmert, the man who first reported seeing the creature, came out to say that he and his friends did not actually see anything and that they made it up as a prank and that the story itself just grew so big and at that point they really couldn't control it. Paisa Bird. Uh, hopefully I said the name right. Uh, also known as the Paisa. It is a creature from Native American mythology and it is depicted in one of the two murals painted by Native Americans. It is on the cliffside above the Mississippi River and is at the end of a chain of limestone bluffs in Madison County, Illinois, which is now Alton. In Alton, Illinois, the one in Alton, Illinois is not the original one, but rather it is based off of old sketches and lithographs and put there. The location of the Paisa in Alton is not really suited to be there and it is often restored the Paisa bird is also commonly called the bird of the evil spirit, or the bird that devours men. It is said to be a fire-breathing winged creature that was featured in the legends of the Elini tribe. It was said that it would snatch members of the tribe living near the river, and it has a shuddering scream. It is also very sneaky and mischievous. Mothman The Mothman is said to be also sighted in Illinois, more specifically around Chicago. Mothman is described as a 7 foot tall, bipedal winged humanoid. It was first sighted in West Virginia. Uh, check out that iceberg if I guess you want to know more about Mothman. His wingspan is around 10 to 15 feet and has the ability to fly over 100 miles per hour. Yeah, uh, like I said, if you want to know more, check out that other video. Should be our first one, I think. One of the first ones. Bigfoot. Bigfoot is a 6 to 9 feet tall creature slash creatures. Some descriptions of Bigfoot do have them going up to 10 to 15 feet. It is a bipedal ape-like creature commonly covered in black, dark brown, and dark reddish fur. And as the name suggests, it does have big feet. Yeah, if you guys know what that's from. It is seen in Illinois quite a lot, actually. On the Bigfoot Research Organization website, Illinois is ranked 5th in the United States for Bigfoot sightings, with 303 reported sightings of Bigfoot. Actually pretty impressive. Uh, I think my last couple ones have been pretty low. Layer 2 The Wolfman of Chestnut Mountain In 2010, the Wolfman was spotted, and it's not a classic werewolf, rather it is more of a wolf that can stand on its hind legs. It is said to have been spotted since the 1980s. The Wolfman looks like a werewolf, but its forelegs are like the hands of a raccoon, and it's around 5 feet tall. 
that's actually kind of short, uh, little wolflet. The most famous sighting was in 2010, when a psychologist was attacked by the wolfman. People also believe that the wolfman is related to the beast of Bray Road in Wisconsin. So yeah, there's not really much info on the wolfman. Uh, he's on level 2 because there's not much information about him, and there's no cryptid wiki on him. Lake Michigan Sea Serpent It is a deep water lake sea monster. It is usually sighted in Lake Michigan. The sightings go back all the way to 1817, and it's described around 30 to 60 feet long. And it looks like an eel, a reptilian head but a snake-like body. It is sometimes called the South Bay Bessie, and it is often seen around the north suburbs of Chicago. Everything I searched while researching this just takes me to the OG Bessie, which is a different cryptid from what I can tell. And yeah, I can't really find much of it. The Farmer City Monster It's another Bigfoot type creature that was spotted on July 9th, 1970. Four boys were sitting by a campfire along Salt Creek just south of Farmer City, Illinois. These four boys heard something or someone approaching them through the tall grass that surrounded their camp. Then it suddenly stopped right before it reached the light. While they stared into the darkness, the creature suddenly darted towards their tent. One of the boys quickly aimed a flashlight at the intruder, revealing it to be a 6 to 7 feet tall creature with glowing yellow eyes and long white slash gray fur. The camper screamed and the beast returned into the darkness at inhuman speeds. The group of boys abandoned the camp and headed to the police station. One of the boys had broken their ankle a few days earlier, but he was so frightened that he forgot his crutches at the campsite. So yeah, again just another Bigfoot. Layer 3 The Enfield Horror I put this entry here in this spot because some say it's a cryptid and then some say it's alien related. So it's here in the middle, a little perfect middle ground. So in the years of 1941 through 1942, there was a string of similar sightings in a small village of Mount Vernon, which was around 40 miles away from Enfield. The thing that they saw was a leaping creature that terrorized the local people and is apparently responsible for the deaths of multiple animals and mutilations in the area. The locals would call it the Mount Vermin Monster. It was vaguely baboon in appearance. It was also said to leap 20 to 40 feet in the air with one bounce. And this one is linked closely to the Enfield Monster, so that's why I'm talking about it. And then in the early 1970s, the Enfield Horror stalked the small town of Enfield, Illinois. On April 25th, 1973, Henry McDaniel and his wife got to their house greeted their kids and then their kids told the story about how something tried to get into their house by scratching at the door. When the oldest went to go see what it was, he found a creature with three legs, a short body, uh, wow, kind of like Omar. Uh, it had two short arms and two pink eyes that were as big as flashlights and around four and a half feet tall, also grayish in color. The kid slammed the door and went to grab his .22 pistol and flashlight. He apparently shot at it four times with him claiming that the first shot hit. Since the creature hissed at him, he then called the police, and when they arrived, the police found scratches all around the house. And yeah, that's basically the first encounter with the creature, if we don't want to count the Mount Vernon monster. There is a lot more to this creature, but I don't want to make this video too long. UFO Ranking So Illinois ranks 40th in UFO sightings. This info is coming from SatelliteInternet.com. It's 33 people per 100,000 that see a UFO in Illinois, uh, which kind of surprised me. I figured there'd be more, but I guess some states have to be at the bottom. But hey, at least they got Bigfoot sightings. 2000 Southern Illinois UFO Incident Black triangles are UFOs that are reported to have triangular shape and dark color. Usually observed at night, they're large, silent, and hover around with pulsating lights. There are many cases of this type of UFO, but the one we will be focusing on is from the year 2000 Illinois case. This UFO is commonly called the St. Clair Triangle. On January 5th, 2000, over the towns of Highland, Dupo, Lebanon, Shiloh, Summerfield, Miltstalt, and O'Fallon, Illinois, at around 4 a.m., multiple people claimed to have sighted a triangular black flying object in the sky. So yeah, a bunch of people throughout all those towns saw black triangle slash black triangles of UFOs in the sky at around 4 a.m. And another interesting little fact about this incident is that multiple different TV shows have covered this case to try and debunk it. 
2004 through 2006 Tinley Park lights. Three red lights hovered in a triangle formation. They were seen by multiple witnesses in Tinley Park in Oak Forest, Illinois on August 24, 2004. Then again on August 31st, 2004. And then again on October 31st, 2004. And then again on October 1st, 2005. And then once again on October 31st, 2006. The lights were photographed and captured on video by some witnesses. According to some UFOologists, the video evidence suggests that the lights kept the geometrical shape and moved as if they were attached to each other through a dark object. So yeah, I'm not too sure about this one just because most of the sightings happened on October, which, you know, Halloween month. So I guess people were either like making jokes about it or just trying to like be, oh, spooky, we saw aliens. And then two of them did happen on Halloween. So yeah. I'm kind of skeptical about this one, but yeah, I just thought I'd mention that. 2006 O'Hare International Airport Sighting At around 4.15 p.m. on November 7th, 2006, 12 United Airlines employees and a few other witnesses outside of the airport saw a UFO. The 12 employees described the UFO as a metallic, saucer-shaped craft that was hovering around the C-17 gate. It was also reported that the UFO was 6 to 24 feet in diameter and completely silent. The people outside of the airport said that it shot through the clouds at a very high velocity that left a clear blue hole in the sky cloud layer, then it closed pretty fast. Both United Airlines and the Federal Aviation Administration, the FAA, initially denied that they had any information about the UFO, but the Chicago Tribune was investigating the report and filed a Freedom of Information Act FOIA, request. The FAA stance concluded that it was caused by weather phenomenon, so they were not investigating the incident. Uh, astronomer Mark Hammergren stated that the weather conditions for that day were right for a hole punch cloud, which should be on the screen right now, and it is an actual weather phenomenon, and I didn't know about that till after this, so uh, I don't know what they saw. Uh, it could be a UFO. Because the weather phenomenon explains the hole in the in the clouds, but doesn't really explain the object that they saw. So I'm not too sure exactly what they saw. Layer four, Chicago River. On July 24th, 1915, the SS Eastland was parked along the Chicago River downtown. It was carrying passengers to an annual picnic for the Western Electric Company. I won't go through that here since it is an entry on this iceberg later on. But you should just know, for now, that a lot of people passed. The city, after the incident, then asked local merchants to open up their businesses to serve as morgues for the time being, so hundreds of bodies filled the shops. And today, locals and tourists have witnessed their own share of ghost sightings within those buildings that the bodies were sighted in. They say that they often see apparitions appear and disappear right before their eyes, and it would seem the ghosts from the incident are forever just cursed to stay in that area. Alton, Illinois. This small town is often considered to be the most haunted town in the United States, with many haunted locations in the town. The Milton Schoolhouse, which was first built in 1904 and ran until it officially closed in 1986. The story of why it's haunted is because a little girl named Mary that was still in the school when everyone left. As she was heading home, she heard noises behind her, and then in the morning, her body was found in the girl's locker room, battered with blood all over. And now, while in that building, you could hear footsteps. Uh, like I said earlier, it is considered the most haunted town in the United States, so there are more haunted locations in this small town. I don't know if I should have talked about the other hauntings in the town, but I didn't. I, I do think I have one later on. <laughs> so yeah, uh, probably, I I'll just put it as the next one. So yeah. Mick Pike Mansion. Okay, so like I said, I didn't include this in the last entry since I wanted it to be its own separate entry. I don't think I said that, but I mean, that, that's the reason. But the mansion is located in Alton, Illinois. It is also considered to be one of the most haunted locations in the United States. It is believed that the haunting comes from before the mansion was even made. The mansion was constructed and completed in 1869. Many think the ghosts that are in the area are from Native Americans. Others say that the ghost comes from a woman who was found dead in one of the mansion's bathtubs but it is said that there is at least 12 ghosts that haunt this location, one of which is the wife of the original owner, Henry McPike. She never actually lived in the house, 
since she died in 1867, but the house was being built before then. There's also another ghost of a young girl named Sarah, who smells like lilac and perfume. There's scraping doors, the laughing of children, unexplained footsteps, and objects disappear and reappear in different locations. So, yeah, uh, while reading up on this, I did kind of want to explore this place one day, if, you know, if we ever have that luxury. Montino State Hospital This was a psychedelic hospital located in Concati County, Illinois. Sorry if I mispronounced that. It was first opened in 1930. It was used to care for patients with mental illnesses. It was apparently going well until 1939, when typhoid fever ran through the place and caused 47 of its patients to pass away. It kept going until 1985, when it stopped operating. The building became a bank, uh, a part of Illinois' Diversitech campus, and even a private residence for a time. There is reported cold spots, strange noises, and voices that come from the intercom system that doesn't even work anymore, so yeah. Uh, I have never heard of a ghost that talks through the intercom system, especially one that is broken. So, uh, <laughs> to me that's actually pretty cool. Resurrection Cemetery Located in Justice, Illinois, it is known to be the home of a ghost called the Resurrection Mary. It is apparently mostly seen by men who drive past the cemetery. Mary is the ghost of a woman that died near the entrance of the cemetery. The encounter usually goes as someone, usually a man, is driving near the cemetery and then they'll see a woman thumbing for a ride. Thumbing? Thumbing for a ride. You know, like a hitchhiker type shit? The person would pick up the woman, then said person would then pick up the woman and then she'll ask to be let out near the entrance of the cemetery. She walks onto the grounds, then disappears. From the research I was doing, there is a bar located across the street from the cemetery entrance, and many people just chill there to try and see Mary, and to find out if she's actually uh, quote-unquote real. Uh, <laughs> maybe we could do that, you know, uh, get a little uh, alcoholism going. Axeman's Bridge. The legend has it that back in the 1970s, a tale unfolded in this area. A man driven by madness brutally ended the lives of his wife, children, and two police officers with an axe. The gruesome aftermath saw their bodies suspended from meat hooks in his shed, and then when the authorities got there, he fled from them. He met his own demise in the nearby woods, where law enforcement eventually, where law enforcement eventually caught up to him, and he basically passed near the bridge, or a bridge, which is now referred to as Axeman's Bridge, or the house that this guy did whatever he did, is just gone now. The locals insist that both the bridge and the woods surrounding the bridge are haunted. People who visit claim that sometimes they see yellow lights that resemble the old house. Others claim to hear screams in the woods, and the ping of an axe hitting the iron supports of a bridge. So yeah. Uh, <laughs> I feel like I would want to visit this place, but I also, I honestly think this one's a little scarier than the other. I don't know why. Uh, maybe just the backstory, but to me, it just feels a little creepier than the others. Tylenol poisonings. Uh, this is something I have been interested in making a video about, but I just feel like it's oversaturated within the space. Uh, I don't want to say this, but oh, fuck it, I'll say it. Uh, for a while, I wouldn't say I was addicted to, uh, like Advil slash Tylenol. It's just that I had chronic headaches for like a long time. Uh, they're a lot better now. I rarely take any of it. But yeah, something that just interested me just because of my own personal history. Uh, I don't know if that's addiction or not, but yeah. Uh, in 1982, in the Chicago area, seven known people would start to get sick after ingesting extra strength Tylenol. And what those individuals didn't know is that the Tylenol bottles they owned had been tampered with. And in reality, the people that had taken the capsules were laced with potassium cyanide. The first victim, Mary Kellerman, took a capsule on September 28th and was hospitalized afterwards. She would die the next day though. Also, that day, three other people would share Tylenol from the same bottle. Like, I think it was her family, uh, her sister, her boyfriend, uh, I don't know. But their names was Adam Janus, Stanley Janus, and Teresa Janus. Uh, all of them were family. Uh, yeah. Uh, Omar wrote these entries for me because uh, I have an essay due for one of my classes and some other stuff. So yeah, o Omar did all the tragedies for me. Uh, they would all die the same day. And there were also three other victims. Mary McFarland, Paula Prince, and Mary Reiner. 
who had their own bottles. An investigation into the Janus' deaths would begin and a nurse, Helen Jensen, would find the Tylenol bottle in the home of the Janus' family and took it due to noticing six pills missing and it being bought on the 29th, she would hand the pill bottle off to investigators who sent it to get tested. It would be found that within the capsules was three times the fatal amount of cyanide. After this was discovered, a press conference was held in order to inform the public of the contaminated Tylenol bottles and told the public to not consume any Tylenol till it was determined to be safe by the public to do. Police would hypothesize that the pill bottles were tampered with after they had been put on the shelf, but other than that, there would be no definitive motive or person around behind the poisonings. There were two main suspects, James Williams Lewis and Roger Arnold, with both having circumstantial evidence that tied them to the crime. James more so as he wrote a letter to Johnson & Johnson demanding a million in exchange for the deaths to stop, which after the police investigation was found to have been written before the deaths even happened, and even had the Department of Justice investigators concluding that he was the culprit. Also both men had books on them on how to poison with cyanide, but there wouldn't be enough evidence to convict either man for the crime, though James would get sent to prison for extortion charges because of the letter. Also, uh, the Unabomber, uh, Ted Kaczynski, was also, uh, th what is, it, is the word tied? I don't know. Uh, he was thought to have caused it at one point as well, so yeah, just thought I'd mention it. Ted Kaczynski will have an entry later in the video as well. Layer 5 John Wayne Gacy House. This location is uh, John Wayne Gacy's house, uh, obviously, as the name suggests. It has been demolished, and a new house has been built on top of it. Obviously, I am going to go more in depth into Gacy's activities later in the video, but this location is said to be haunted by his past victims. Also something interesting that I found while I was researching is that when it was demolished, it was left as a lot for a couple of years, but during that time, the grass and the weeds just didn't grow at all. I don't know if that's because it was haunted or I, I just don't know why, but it's still kind of interesting. Obviously someone else lives there now, so it's not open to the public, but people do say it's haunted. Uh, I don't think it is because who would want to live in that little area? Uh, maybe some freak. The Crenshaw Mansion. This house was constructed back in the 1830s. It was the main home to the Crenshaw family. John Crenshaw was recognized as a person who would kidnap free African Americans and would then sell them off to the slave states. The property was also part of the reverse Underground Railroad. So yeah, if you understand what the Underground Railroad is, this was basically just the opposite. The house is reportedly haunted by the ghost of a slave that is known as Big Jim. The ghost activity that happens here is pretty mundane from all the stuff I've read, but I did put it a bit lower due to the history of the house and the owner. Illinois did buy the property back in 2000 and had it open to the public for a while, but it is now closed off. The Englewood Post Office this post office now sits on the grounds of the home of the infamous serial killer, H.H. H. Holmes. His house is demolished now, obviously, because the post office sits there now, but his house was built back in 1839. He had multiple different contractors build his house because he didn't want people to know the blueprints to his house. The house had hallways that were dead ends with no doors or windows. He designed the house so that his victims would be confused when they tried to escape. Uh, he will also have an entry later in the video, so I'll just basically skip that. The post office that now sits on top of the what was H.H. H. Holmes house is filled with reported hauntings. The basement is said to fill anyone who enters with fear and anxiety. There is reports of strange voices, cold temperatures slash cold spots, and ghosts that touch you. So yeah, uh, like I said, H.H. H. Holmes will have an entry later on in the video. Uh, I think I'm supposed to do an obligatory uh, state for the video if you want to know more about that, so yeah. Lincoln Park Zoo The land in which the zoo is now located on was once the town cemetery. During the mid-1800s, it was home to more than 35,000 dead bodies. Most of those bodies have been relocated over the years, but it has recently been discovered that 12,000 more bodies are still buried there. The zoo actually holds an event every year because it is believed to be haunted due to the amount of bodies that were there and are still there. There's a ghost of a woman that is seen walking around the zoo, and that is spotted near the Lion House, which uh, that's the website that I found called it Lion House. I assume it's just like the lion enclosure. And she's close to that, 
and the woman's restroom, then the woman that are in the restroom will end up seeing her in the reflection of the mirror, and then the lights will flicker. So, uh, I assume there's more, but I didn't really want to get into it. I also assume there's more ghosts, it's just that I can only really find information about the ghost of the woman. Columbia. On July 5th, 1918, a paddle steamer boat was on the Illinois River after stopping twice in Kingston Mines and second in Pekin. After leaving Pekin, which was at 8.15, it would end up docking at A.L. Fresco Park for 30 minutes before once again heading into the river. It was after this break when it was back in the river, just after the boat passed in the Poria and Pekin Union Ridgeway Bridge, that it would run into extremely dense fog, causing the pilot of the ship to lose control of it for a bit, where it would end up drifting towards the side of the river. After the ship was able to be controlled again, the captain ordered the pilot to take them back to shore. Unbeknownst to the captain and the pilot, a log ended up causing a large hole in the ship's side, so the boat tried to make its way to shore. The deck of the ship would collapse on top of each other and end up sinking at around 12.05 am on July 6th, resulting in 87 casualties. Green Hornet Streetcar Disaster aka the 1950 CTA Chicago Transit Authority streetcar. It's one of those bus looking train things that run on tracks laid in the streets and not an actual car. Uh, the crash happened on May 25th, 1950 and started when the mortarman of the streetcar tried to avoid a flooded underpass and in doing so ended up crashing into a gasoline truck. This happened due to the person driving not paying attention when switching lanes, which he didn't slow down for and drove into the gasoline truck. The gasoline truck would end up getting jackknifed and then blocking the street and that was when several people died on impact. A couple did survive and tried to make their way out of the streetcar, but not everyone could make it out as the gasoline truck would end up exploding and in the end, the accident killed 34 people and injured 50 and caused $150,000 or $1.75 million in 2022 money worth of damages, not including what the city had to pay up the victims of the accident which totaled about $900,000 at the time. The Centralia Mine Disaster March 25th, 1947, in the town of Centralia, Illinois, at around 327, the power to the Centralia Mine No. 5 would suddenly stop. After the power went out, there was a large buildup of dust for about 5 minutes. The miners weren't quite sure what it was, but did notice that it was black and smelled. This dust turned out to be coal dust. A little while later, something would ignite the coal dust, causing an explosion that would end up claiming the lives of 65 of the 142 men inside the mine. But that wasn't the end of the disaster. After the explosion, the mix of gases started to poison survivors. This after damp would end up taking another 45 lives from the mines totaling in 111 men being killed, though thankfully 31 would be able to make it out alive. The cause of this explosion will be blamed on a lake of appropriate safety measures. As the government regulators and inspector had told the mine owners about their lacking response, the many warnings the owners got were not enforced, which led to the buildup of coal dust. Diamond Mine Disaster, 1883. Near Braidwood, Illinois, at the Diamond Mine No. 2 coal mine, after an intense rainy days, a lot of the water left from small to snow, the area around the Diamond Mine had accumulated a decent amount of surface water. This water had nowhere to go, so it just kept accumulating. This would lead to February 16, 1883, when the Diamond Mine was still open and operating, despite the fact that the adjacent mines were closed and would be flooded. Surface water was seen going into the mine, and the people overseeing that day's work saw no problem with it, so down went the workers. It wasn't until about the afternoon that the water became a worry, so the person making sure the water level stayed safe went up to check if the pumps pumping out the water were working fine, which they were, but despite that, the water would quickly still fill up the mine, and the alarm would be sounded to tell everyone to try to get out of the mine. Within the 30 minutes, the mine was completely flooded, and 74 of the 185 miners that went to work that day drowned. Above ground efforts would start to be organized, and large pumps would soon be brought to the mine to pump out water which would last for 38 days, then which rescue workers went down to try and find survivors and bodies, though they wouldn't be able to go far into the mine because of how dangerous it was, and after a couple of days later, the rescue would be called off. The Great Chicago Fire of 1871 On October 8th, 1871, a fire would break out near a barn 
just southwest of the city center in Chicago. While there's no definite answer as to how the fire started, there are a couple of theories. Most assume that it has something to do with a lantern being dropped by accident. Whatever the origin of the fire, two things are known contributors to the quick spread of the fire. Firstly, that year the summer of Chicago was drier than usual and had brought a drought. Secondly, was that most buildings in Chicago at the time were constructed with wood. Wind would blow the fire from building to building and with the dry land all around the blaze would grow rapidly. The Chicago Fire Department also accidentally, when first trying to go and deal with the fire, would be sent to the wrong location due to human error, which allowed the fire more time to spread. The fire starting in the south would rage through the city, jumping the river and making it all the way over to the north of the city and lasted for two days, finally dying down on the 10th of October, mainly due to the fire having already burned everything that it could. In total, this disaster would claim an estimated 300 lives and burn about 2,122 acres of land costing the city of Chicago $222 million in 1871, or $5.5 billion in 2022 dollars. Layer 6 The 2003 Chicago Balcony Collapse On June 29, 2003, in Lincoln Park, Chicago, a Porsche attached to an apartment building was involved in a collapse that would end up taking the lives of 13 people and injuring 57, and is considered the deadliest Porsche collapse. The initial belief of the collapse seems to be the fact that too many people were on it at the same time as the apartment, second and third floor, had been the site of a party. The porch was holding 50 people at the time, despite only meaning to hold a max of 30. The collapse came in shortly after midnight, with the third floor balcony, falling first and dragging the other balconies below into the basement of the building. The city would end up suing the owner and managers of the building due to breaches in the building's regulations, as it came to light that the reason for the collapse was actually due to poor construction. The 1967 Chicago Blizzard From January 26, 1967 to January 27, 1967, $150 million worth of damage would be done to the city of Chicago as a blizzard raged on for 29 hours, bridging with it a record of 23 inches of snowfall and 50 miles per hour winds. A large portion of commuters and people living in Chicago would end up being stranded by the blizzard with an estimated 2,000 abandoned cars and on the road 101,000 abandoned buses since the blizzard hit at 5.02 a.m. when most people would start to head off to work. In total, 26 people would die due to this blizzard in the city of Chicago for a variety of reasons, but in total, 60 people within that region of Illinois would lose their life to the blizzard. SS Eastland uh, Like I mentioned earlier uh, during the uh, ghost section, uh, <laughs> here's the entry. On July 24th, 1915, Five steamers, the Eastland, Theodore, Roosevelt, Pidoski, Racine, and Rochester were going to take employees of the Western Electric Company and their families through the Chicago River to a picnic at the Michigan City, Indiana. Boarding passengers on the south bank of the Chicago River by 7.10 a.m., the boat ended up carrying 2,572 passengers, and then soon after, the Eastland began to tilt portside. Uh, left, I'm pretty sure, which is when the vessel would take on water and tilts to the side. To counter this, the crew of the Eastland allowed water into the ballast tanks, but it didn't really stop it. And by 728, the Eastland would end up rolling over onto its port side. There isn't a 100% definitive reason as for why the boat began to like list over. What is known is that there were two factors that didn't help the ship's stability. One was the addition of more lifeboats due to the law passed because of the sinking of the Titanic. In order to be able to take on a max of 2,570 people, they added more lifeboats instead of decreasing the amount of people allowed onto the boat, which caused the boat to be more top heavy and the hardwood floor of the dining room being replaced with concrete. <laughs> what the fuck? Uh, which added 15 to 20 extra tons of weight. In total, 844 people would die due to this incident and even ended up being the third deadliest peacetime marine time catastrophe. So yeah, I didn't want to mention the amount of people that died earlier because uh, obviously this is an entry. But yeah, I didn't know that with the, with, the, um, <laughs> with the concrete. What the fuck were they thinking, dude? Jesus Christ. Dixon Bridge Disaster. Also known as the Truesdale Bridge Disaster, the collapse of this bridge would occur on May 4th, 1873 in the small town of Dixon, Illinois. The collapse all began from a reverend for a Baptist church 
had decided to invite his congregation to the river in order to baptize six people. Most of those that came to view the baptism had decided to stand on the bridge, filling it with about 150 to 200 people. The reverend had done this before, three other times, and of course nothing happened, so this time, he decided to make it last a little while longer. While it was safe the other times, it was during him baptizing two of the six people and the choir started to sing that some people felt like the bridge was vibrating and had decided to get them and their kids off the bridge, when suddenly, people heard a sharp cracking sound coming from one end of the bridge, then the west side of the bridge would begin to drop, and many would start screaming as that part of the bridge would start to fall 18 feet down into the river, and soon the parts of the bridge would also start to begin to fall into the river. This ended up killing 46 people and injuring at least 56. Blame would be placed on the Baptist who were there, the people who made the bridge in the Dixon City Council. And later on, May 24th, 1873, the Scientific American would publish an analysis of the bridge collapse and found that the construction and materials of the bridge were lackluster and to blame for the collapse of the bridge. Tri-State Tornado, 1925. 695 people died and 2,027 people injured. On March 18th, 1925, a tornado outbreak known as the Great Tri-State Tornado Outbreak would hit many states but one tornado hit three states, Mississippi, Missouri, Illinois, and Indiana. In Illinois, the counties of Jackson, Williamson, Franklin, Hamilton, and the communities of Gorham, Murfreesboro, DeSoto, Hurstbush, Ziegler, West Frankfort, 18, Parrish, Crossville, would see massive amounts of destruction from this, from this tornado outbreak. The tornado that hit Illinois Missouri and Indiana was an F5 of catastrophic proportions, with it having a 4 to 4 to 1 mile path width, traveling a total of 219 miles and reaching a wind strength of just less than 300 miles per hour. In total, this tornado would claim 695 lives, with 613 of those being from Illinois, 234 of those deaths coming from the community of Murfreesboro, and 71 from Indiana leaving a total of 2,027 people injured and costing $17 million of damages, which is equivalent to $295 million in today's money. Layer 7 Iroquois Theater Fire I hope I said that name right. On December 31st, 1903, in Chicago, just a month after it opened, the Iroquois Theater would witness the deadliest single building disaster in U.S. history until 9-11. It happened during a showing of the musical Mr. Bluebeard, which had sold out seats plus several hundred standing room tickets. The theater held an estimated 2,100 people to 2,200 people. It was during the second act of the play when the arc light would start sparking, assumably due to short circuiting, and those sparks would end up catching a Muslim curtain, uh, a type of curtain, on fire. The fire would quickly race up the curtain where it reached a highly flammable painted canvas. There were two attempts to stop the fire before it reached the canvas. One was to douse the killed free canisters, a chemical flame dousing compound, but by the time they used it on the fire, it had already spread too much. And then the Bestos fire curtain was attempted to be lowered to contain the fire, but it would end up being caught on a light reflector. Even worse, a later test on the curtain revealed that it was, it was mainly made of wood pulp, which actually wouldn't have helped with the fire. Eddie Foy, an actor in the play, attempted to keep the crowd calm despite the stage having pieces of flaming canvas fall onto it, and it worked for some of the showgoers. But for the rest of the audience, they quickly and chaotically rushed to emergency exits and windows. In an attempt to exit the building, many of these exits would not be opened due to the doors having bascule locks, aka espagnolets. Those who wouldn't be able to make it out of the building would have to fight to make their way out, many dying by being trampled, crushed, or asphyxiated due to smoke. A place in the building that many people died was at the base of the staircase. Many on those on stage were able to exit through the dressing room windows or the west stage floor. The firefighters did not know the fire was happening until a stagehand made it to the nearest firehouse from the theater since the theater had no telephone or firebox to alert the firefighters. The firefighters wouldn't get there till 3.33. Meanwhile, the fire had started around 3.15. It was estimated that a total of 575 people died that day. Some survivors told of climbing the bodies of people who had perished to reach the outside, 
and the corpses were stacked about 10 feet high on some exits. 250 people would end up being injured from this event, and 30 of those people would end up succumbing to their injuries, causing the death toll of the fire to reach 602 people. Our Lady of the Angeles School Fire On December 1st, 1958 in Chicago, the Our Lady of the Angel School would be set ablaze, causing a lot of damage to the school and taking the lives of faculty and students. After the fire had died down, and an investigation into the origin of how this fire started, many things would be learned from the investigation. Firstly is that the fire started in the basement, and that the cause of the fire is still unknown to this day. There was a boy who would confess that he started the fire, but the investigation would rule out that possibility. The fire started between 2 and 2.20, and would remain undetected for about 20 minutes, allowing for smoke to build up in the halls and the staircase. The original source of the fire started from a trash can filled with cardboard. The fire was first noticed by three different students who saw the smoke and warned a teacher who began to line her class up to evacuate, but when the teacher opened the doors to leave, she deemed it too dangerous to go out and decided it would be better if the class stayed in the room and waited for rescue. Shortly thereafter, the fire alarms would go off as the fire grew more intense. The fire would end up burning some materials that caused more smoke, which was also thicker, to start coming from the flames, which would end up leading to more deaths. As the fire grew within the building, more people started to notice, like the janitor who would warn some of the kids about the fire when he saw it. Those kids in turn warned their teacher, which would also lead to another class and their teacher to evacuate the building. And obviously someone would be sent to call for the fire department. A teacher tried pulling a fire alarm while exiting the building, but for some reason it wouldn't go off. Though the teacher would go back and pull it again, and that time it would go off, but not warn the fire department. The fire department wouldn't get a call to come till 1242. The reason as to why it took so long, despite the fact that someone was sent to call at 1230 is not known, but the firefighters would come within four minutes of the call. With time, they would eventually put out the fire, but it was a struggle, and they saved as many people as they could. In total, safely retrieving more than 160 kids, many that were pulled had already died to bad burns or smoke inhalation. In total, 95 people would pass. 92 of which were kids, and 3 of them were nuns. The Unabomber Real name, Ted Kaczynski. He was born in Chicago, Illinois on May 22, 1942. He was an American mathematician and domestic terrorist. Although he was a mathematics prodigy, he abandoned that in 1969 to pursue a primitive lifestyle. Between 1978 and 1995, Kaczynski mailed or hand-delivered a series of bombs that would overall kill 3 people, but it did injure 23 others. On May 25th, 1978, and on May 9th, 1979, he would send two bombs to the Northwestern University. Both of these bombs detonated, but only two people were injured, with minor cuts and burns. On November 15th, 1979, American's airline flight 444 had a bomb detonate in the middle of the flight. Luckily, the bomb was only in the cargo hold. The plane did lose air pressure and smoke did fill the passenger cabin. 12 people did have to be treated for smoke inhalation. Then, on June 10, 1980, Kaczynski targeted Percy Addison Wood Jr., who was a United Airlines executive. He sent a bomb to his Lake Forest, Illinois home. Inside the package was a copy of the book, Ice Brothers, which had a bomb rigged to it. Wood suffered burns and cuts over much of his body when he opened the package. So those four were the only ones that happened in Illinois. On October 8, 1981, a bomb was sent to the University of Utah, and that one was managed to be defused. On November 5, 1982, he sent one to Vanderbilt University in Tennessee, which did go off and injured a university secretary. She had several burns to her hands and shrapnel wounds in her body. On July 2, 1989, he sent a bomb to the University of California, Berkeley. The victim was an engineering professor and suffered severe burns and shrapnel wounds to his hands and face. On May 15, 1985, at the same place, a graduate student also got injured with a loss of four fingers, severed artery on the right arm, in the right arm, and partial loss of vision on his left eye. On June 13, 1985, the Boeing company in Auburn, Washington had a bomb, but it was defused. On November 15, 1985, the University of Michigan, a psychology professor got temporary hearing loss and a research assistant for burns and shrapnel wounds after a bomb from the Unabomber went off. On December 11, 1985, in Sacramento, California, Hugh Scruton, a computer store owner, died due to one of the bombs from the Unabomber. On February 20th, 1987, in Salt Lake City, Utah, another computer store owner suffered severe nerve damage to his left arm from a bomb. 
On June 22, 1999, in Tiburon, California, a geneticist received severe damage to both of his eardrums with partial hearing loss and the loss of three fingers. On June 24, 1999, in Yale University, Connecticut, a computer science professor received several burns and shrapnel wounds and damage to his right eye and the loss and use of his right hand. December 10, 1994, in North Codwell, New Jersey, Thomas J. Mosser, an advertising executive at Bernson Marson Teller, was killed after opening a mail bomb sent to his home. In a letter to New York Times, Kaczynski wrote that he had sent the bomb because Moser's work repairing the public image of Exxon after the Exxon Valdez oil spill. On April 24, 1995, Gilbert Brent Murray passed. Uh, he was the president of a timber industry lobbying group uh, from California's Forestry Association by a mail bomb. It was addressed to the previous president, William Dennison, who already retired, and Murray passed. Throughout the years, Kaczynski developed a quote-unquote extremist ideologies that were combined with elements of environmentalism and anti-technology sentiments and anarchism. Because of that, he decided that his best way to advance his cause was to send bombs. Kaczynski's manifesto was published in a supplement to the Washington Post, and in summary, his manifesto presents a critique of modern industrial society, arguing that technological progress, progress has led to the erosion of human freedom and dignity. He advocates for a revolution against the industrial technological system in order to restore individual autonomy and fulfillment. After the manifesto was published, the FBI received many tips. Eventually, on April 3, 1996, Kaczynski was arrested in his cabin. A search revealed the cache of bomb components and 40,000 handwritten journal pages that included bomb-making experiments, descriptions of the Unabomber's crimes, and one life bomb. Also, another interesting thing that I found while researching is that he was a person of interest in the Chicago Tylenol murders, which I already talked about earlier in the video. The Unabomber died in June 10th, 2023 at 12.23 a.m. Kaczynski was found in a cell unresponsive. He was taken to a hospital where he was pronounced dead. The Federal Bureau of Prisons did not specify a cause, but three people familiar with the situation said he died by suicide. He was also in the late stages of cancer. Uh, obviously, there's a lot more to this whole case, uh, but I tried summarizing it as best as I can, with still giving a decent amount of info as to do the entry justice. Layer 8 H.H. H. Holmes whose real name was Herman Webster Mudgate. <laughs> what the fuck? He was an infamous American serial killer who operated in the late 19th century. He is often referred to as America's first documented serial killer. Holmes is notorious for constructing a house slash building he commissioned. Uh, I basically already explained that, but I don't know if I should re-say it or just add it later. Well, I'll see. Uh, anyways, he had multiple different contractors build him this building slash house because he did not want people to know the blueprints of his house. His house had hallways that were dead ends, with no doors and windows. He designed his house so that the victims would be confused when they tried to escape. Holmes' modus operandi involved luring guests, mostly young women, to his uh, building with promises of employment or lodging. Once inside, he would trap and murder them, often through various gruesome methods such as asphyxiation, poisoning, and dismemberment. The layout of the Quote unquote murder castle was designed with secret passages, trap doors, soundproof rooms, and other sinister features to aid in his crimes and dispose of the bodies discreetly. He was also known for insurance fraud schemes and swindling investors, adding another layer of to his criminal activity. His crimes were eventually uncovered partly due to the suspicions raised by insurance companies and the disappearance of several of his associates. He was arrested in 1894 and later confessed to 27 murders. Although the true number of his victims remains unknown, and it, people think that it could be much higher than that. And Jeffrey Dahmer, also known as the Milwaukee Cannibal or the Milwaukee Monster. He was an American serial killer that was born on May 21st in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and died on November 28th, 1994. Dahmer's crimes involved the sexual assault, murder, dismemberment, and sometimes cannibalization of 17 young men and boys. He has 17 victims and most of them were found in his apartment. I think I'll only talk about the first and last murders he committed since this video is already long enough. I will say Dahmer would lure men from Chicago's gay scene to his home in Milwaukee so that's why he's on here. His first murder was a man named Stephen Hicks. He committed it in 1978 on June 18th 
Dahmer picked up Steven while he was hitchhiking to a rock concert in Chipekawa Lake Park, Ohio. He agreed to go to Dahmer to his home since he was the only one there that day under the guise of a few beers. Dahmer would dissolve his flesh in acid and crushed his bones with a sledgehammer and scattered them in the woodland behind his family home. His last murder was a man named Joseph Bradhoft, in which he committed the murder on July 19, 1991. Joseph was strangled by Dahmer and left on the bedsheets for two days, and on July 21st, he removed the bedsheet and found his head covered in maggots. He decapitated the body and cleaned the head and placed it in his refrigerator. He also used acid in his body along with the bodies of two previous victims within the previous month. Dahmer was caught on July 22nd after he tried to murder another victim named Tracy Edwards. He escaped and flagged down two police officers, in which they got to Dahmer's apartment. He invited them in and tried to explain the situation, but they ended up finding Polaroids where many of them were dismembered human bodies. Dahmer tried to fight the officers but was quickly overpowered by them and was arrested. He confessed in the early hours of July 23rd. On July 25th, he was charged with four counts of first degree murder, and by August 22nd, he was charged with further 11. He was convicted on February 17, 1992, and then on November 28, 1994, Dahmer left the cell to conduct an assigned work detail, and two fellow inmates accompanied him, Jesse Anderson and Christopher Scarver. They were left unsupervised in the showers of the prison gym for about 20 minutes. Scarver attacked both Jesse and Dahmer and killed both of them. John Wayne Gacy Also known as the Killer Clown, he was an American serial killer and sex offender who sexually assaulted tortured and murdered at least 33 young men and boys near Chicago, Illinois. He became known as the Killer Clown due to his public performances as a clown before the discovery of his crimes. He committed all of the known murders in his house. Typically he would lure a victim to his home and dupe them into donning handcuffs on the pretext of demonstrating a magic trick. He would then sexually assault and torture his captive before killing his victim by either asphyxiation or strangulation with a garrote. 26 victims were buried in his crawl space in his home, and 3 were also buried in his property. 4 were discarded in the De Plains River. Before any of the murders, he would sexually assault many minors. On May 7, 1968, Gacy pleaded guilty to one count of sodomy in relation to Donald Voorhees Jr. Gacy was granted parole with 12 months probation on June 18, 1970. Having served 18 months of his 10-year sentence, Conditions of his probation included a nightly curfew in that Gacy would relocate to Chicago to live with his mother. His first known murder occurred on January 3, 1972. He lured 16-year-old Timothy Jack McCoy from Chicago's Greyhound bus terminal into his car. McCoy was going to his father's home in Omaha, Nebraska, but his bus would not be there until noon. Gacy took McCoy sightseeing and then to his home saying that he can wait here until he has to leave. Gacy claimed that he woke up and saw McCoy standing in his bedroom doorway, holding a kitchen knife. Gacy then wrestled with McCoy for a bit and eventually found each other on the floor. Gacy would then stab him repeatedly in the chest. As McCoy was dying, Gacy claimed to wash the knife in the bathroom, then he went into the kitchen where he saw breakfast for two. He had walked into Gacy's room to awake him while absentmindedly carrying the knife. Gacy buried McCoy in his crawlspace and later covered his grave with a layer of concrete. Gacy said that immediately after killing McCoy, he felt totally drained, yet noted that as he stabbed McCoy and listened to the gurgulations and gasping, he had experienced a mind-numbing orgasm. That's when he realized that death was the ultimate thrill. His last believed victim is Robert Peast. On December 11, 1978, Gacy visited the Nissan Pharmacy in De Plains to talk about a potential remodeling deal with the store owner, Phil Torf. Robert Peast worked at the pharmacy. Gacy mentioned that his firm sometimes hired teenage boys at a starting wage of $5 an hour, which was almost double of what Peace was making at the pharmacy. Gacy left and Peace's mother arrived to pick up her son because she wanted to celebrate her birthday together. Peace asked his mom to wait and that some contractor wants to talk to him about a job. He left the store around 9 p.m., promising to return shortly. Peace was murdered shortly after 10 p.m. at Gacy's house. When Peace felt to return, his family filed a missing person report with the De Plains police. Torf named Gacy as the contractor Peace had most likely left the store to talk to. During the investigation, police obtained a search warrant for Gacy's house, and on December 21, 1978, while executing the search warrant, police discovered evidence linking Gacy to the disappearance of Peace and other missing teenagers. 
This evidence included items such as clothing belonging to the victims and personal belongings of Peast. They also found evidence of Gacy's crimes including restraints, handcuffs, and other incriminating items. After the discovery of this evidence, Gacy was arrested and charged with multiple counts of murder. The subsequent investigation uncovered the horrifying extent of Gacy's crimes, ultimately leading to his conviction for the murders of at least 33 young men and boys. Larry Ayler, also known as the Interstate Killer or the Highway Killer. Ayler was born on December 21st, 1952 in Crawfordsville, Indiana. He was an American serial killer who murdered at least 21 teenage boys and young men. He would often pick up hitchhikers or young men in bars before subjugating them to brutal assaults and ultimately murdering them. Eiler's victims were found in various states leading to his nickname. Eiler's crimes went undetected for several years, but he eventually came under suspicion in 1983 when he was arrested for the murder of 23-year-old Daniel Bridges. While in custody, Eiler confessed to multiple other murders and provided details that linked him to numerous unsolved cases. In exchange for providing information about his other victims, Eiler was able to avoid facing the death penalty in Illinois. He was sentenced to 60 years in prison for the murder of Daniel Bridges. However, Eiler died in prison on March 6, 1994, at the age of 41, before he could be tried for any of the other murders he confessed to. On screen, there should be a list of all his murder victims, but like I said on the Jeffrey Dahmer one, or one of them, I'll only talk about his first and last known ones. On October 23, 1982, Eiler abducted and murdered 19-year-old Stephen Crockett. His body was found in Kankaki County, Illinois, 12 hours after he was murdered. And on August 19, 1984, Daniel Bridges was lured by Eiler to his apartment. Inside Eiler's apartment, the youth was bound to a chair with clothesline before he was beaten, tortured, then stabbed to death. Eiler then dismembered Bridges' body in his bathroom. His body was cut into eight pieces, each of which was completely drained of blood before being placed inside six separate plastic bags. The body was discovered by a janitor named Joseph Bala on the morning of August 21st, 1984. Bala reported it to the police and Eiler was then arrested. Forensic examination of Eiler's apartment found a lot of blood that had recently been cleaned and repainted over. Eiler was brought to trial for the aggravated kidnapping, unlawful restraint, and murder and concealment of the body of Daniel Bridges on July 1st, 1986. He was tried in Cook County, Illinois, and the judge over the case, Judge Urso, sentenced Eiler to the death penalty via lethal injection on October 3rd. Larry Eiler died in the infirmary of the Pontiac Correctional Center on March 6, 1994. His death was due to AIDS-related complications. He had been seriously ill for approximately 10 days prior to his death. Obviously, there's a lot more to this case, and I just can't go too in-depth into this because uh, it's an ice rig video, and same with a lot of the other cases. Robert Ben Rhodes. He's also known as the truck stop killer. He was an American serial killer and long haul truck driver who operated during the 1980s and the early 1990s. He was convicted of multiple murders and is suspected of being involved in many more. Rhodes' modus operandi involved picking up female hitchhikers or sex workers while traveling across the United States. He would then imprison, torture, and ultimately kill them inside his truck's customized sleeper cab which he had modified into a torture chamber. One of the most chilling aspects to his crimes was his meticulous record keeping. He maintained a detailed journal where he documented his victims suffering and took photographs of them in various stages of distress and even after death. These records provided crucial evidence against him during his trial. His known victim in Illinois was 14-year-old Regina K. Walters. She was badly decomposed when they found her body on December 29, 1990 in the loft of an abandoned barn near Greensville. She had been missing since February 1990, when she ran away from her home in Pasadena with her boyfriend, 18-year-old Ricky Lee Jones. An autopsy revealed that she had been strangled to death sometime in early March. A photograph of Walters being tortured was found in the home of Rhodes. On May 26, 1990, the partial skeleton of Jones was found near Harleton, Texas, and it showed that he was shot in the head. Rhodes' crimes came to light in 1990 when he was arrested in Arizona after a state trooper discovered a terrified young woman intended to be his next victim, chained and handcuffed in his truck. This led to the discovery of evidence linking him to multiple murders across different states. In 1994, Rhodes was convicted of three murders in Texas and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. However, he is suspected of being responsible for numerous other murders spanning several states and decades. Johan Johan Otto Hotch? Uh, I don't know. I don't really care either. Also known as a Bluebeard Murderer, 
and the Chicago Bluebeard. He immigrated to United States in the 1890s and dropped his surname in favor of associated pseudonyms, where he began to marry a string of women, frequently taking the name of his most recent victim. Hodge used matrimonial ads to find victims. He would swindle all their money and would either leave them or kill them with arsenic, and then he would do it all over again. Chicago police would call him America's greatest mass murderer. Reports credit Hodge with, with 25 to 50 murders, but police were only certain of 15, and in the end, he went to trial for a single homicide. There's a giant list of all his victims on Wikipedia. There should be one scrolling on the screen right now, but I won't talk about it since it'll take too long. The Ripper Crew Also known as the Chicago Rippers, they were an organized crime group of serial killers, cannibals, rapists, and necrophiles. The members of the crew are Robert Gench, Edward Sprintzer, Andrew and Thomas Coco Rallis. I don't care if I mispronounce the names, uh, fuck them. They are suspected of the murders of 17 women in Illinois in 1981 and 1982, as well as an unrelated fatal shooting of a man. The first victim of the Ripper crew was 28-year-old Linda Sutton. She was abducted on May 23, 1981, and 10 days later her body was found in the field at Villa Park, Illinois. Her body had been mutilated and her left breast had been amputated. Their last victim was Berkeley Washington. They were found by a railroad track on December 6th. Her injuries were her left breast had been amputated and her right breast was severely slashed. She somehow survived the attack and was able to give descriptions of the men and the van they used to kidnap her. And then that ultimately led to the arrest and the conviction of the members of the Ripper crew. Robert Gench was sentenced to 120 years in prison for his role in the murders. Edward Spritzer was also sentenced to life in prison. Andrew Corrales was sentenced to death and was executed by lethal injection in 1999. Thomas Cocorales was initially sentenced to death, but later had his sentence commuted to life imprisonment. The Southside Strangler, uh, Chicago. That's how it was categorized on Wikipedia. So yeah, that's how I'm gonna say it here. This was an epithet that the media gave to a serial killer in Chicago. It was later used by law enforcement it was given to an active serial killer in South Side of Chicago from the 1990s to through the 2000s. The serial killer was responsible for the murders of numerous girls and young women. In reality, the serial killer wasn't actually a serial killer, and all the crimes were actually committed by different people, including several different serial killers. And I'll just say here, like all the killers and stuff that were responsible for the quote-unquote South Side Strangler. Andre Crawford was responsible for the deaths of 11 women in Inglewood between 1993 and 1999 and it's notable for his disturbing practice of engaging in sexual acts with the corpses. Hubert Geralds, dubbed the Englewood Strangler, murdered five women in Englewood from 1994 to 1995, and in 1999, DNA evidence led to his conviction for a murder of which another individual, Derek Fulligan, had previously been wrongfully convicted. Fluolan suspected in other Englewood killings was later exonerated. Geralds initially faced charges for six murders, but was dropped after Andre Crawford confessed to the killing and provided more detailed information than Gerald's. Kevin Taylor, a former Cheesecake Factory worker, killed four women during the summer of 2001, disposing of their bodies in alleyways, garbage cans, and abandoned houses across the South Side. Gregory Klepper operated in South Side between 1991 and 1996, also facing sexual assault charges in St. Paul, Minnesota. Arrested in 1996 for strangling Patricia Scott, Klepper was implicated in at least 26 murders, primarily involving prostitution and drug addiction. Although he claimed to have killed around 40 women while under the influence of, of drugs, DNA analysis excluded him from at least 14 cases. Earl Mack Jr. was later arrested for one of the murders Klepper confessed to. Klepper was ultimately convicted of Scott's murder in July 2001, operating, receiving an 80-year prison sentence with no parole. Ralph Harris assaulted 26 women in Chatham and Avalon Park from 1992 and 1995, sexually assaulting and killing six of them, while others survived with gunshot wounds. Joffrey T. Griffin killed seven sex workers and drug addicts in Roseland between 1998 and 2000. So yeah, uh, I'm gonna try to put pictures of these guys <laughs> as I'm saying them. Uh, I should have downloaded the photos or photos of them while researching. Hopefully I can find some. The Chicago Strangler Kind of a short entry, but it's a theorized serial killer or serial killers and they're believed to be responsible for the deaths of a number of women in Chicago. Uh, since 2001, at least 50 women between the ages of 18 and 58 
have all been murdered in a similar way in Chicago. The majority of the victims were African American, frequently engaged in sex work, and often had prior involvement with the legal system. Uh, most of them were strangled, partially or fully undressed, and then left in deserted buildings, alleys, dumpsters, parks, or snow-covered areas. Law enforcement did close 25 cases, which led to the apprehension of 13 individuals. A significant number of the strangulations occurred within just three police districts situated in the south and west sides of Chicago. These areas known for their histories of violent crime and drug activity, such as Washington Park and Garfield Park, were frequent sites of these uh, crimes. This trend was identified in 2018 by the Murder Accountability Project, or MAP, which scrutinized more than 50 unresolved cases of strangulation and asphyxiation dating back to 2001. MAP's algorithm sorts unsolved homicides based on location, victim demographics, and method of killing to pinpoint clusters associated with low rates of case resolution. According to MAP's analysis, these patterns could suggest that there's a presence of an active serial killer in the, those areas of Chicago. Hey, what's up guys? It's Aris, and welcome to the outro. I didn't do an intro because I felt like it wasn't really needed. Anyways, hopefully you stick around for our next videos, slash videos. Also, let me know what state I should cover next in this series uh if you're interested in the other states we do have a playlist of them on the channel i hope everyone has a good day or had a good day depending on when you're even listening to this if you're listening to this let uh if you are uh fuck let me let me find something uh type in beetroot in the comments to see if you made it this far i would really appreciate that anyways uh like i said have a good day and uh yeah Ha <laughs>